This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidou York. It's Wednesday, February 17th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of coronavirus, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look different today and in the near future as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VUE headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on and we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. We begin in Nigeria, where an identified gunman attacked a secondary school in the country's Niger state early on Wednesday and abducted many students, according to the state governor's spokeswoman. The attackers stormed the government science college in Kagara district around 2 a.m., overwhelming the security at the school. The spokeswoman said a mass abduction of students had occurred without specifying how many had been taken. It was not immediately clear who had taken them. While the militant Islamist group Boko Haram and a branch of Islamic State are active in northern Nigeria, kidnapping by other armed groups, mostly for ransom, are also common. Zimbabwe will begin vaccinating against COVID-19 on Thursday, starting with health workers and other essential service personnel, according to a government announcement on Tuesday. The Southern African country, which has so far reported more than 3,500 COVID-19 cases, and 1,410 deaths aims to vaccinate 60% of its nearly 16 million population in three phases. Only a handful of African nations have begun giving vaccinations as the continent scrambles to obtain supplies for its 1.3 billion people. Zimbabwe's first coronavirus vaccines, 200,000 doses of the Sinopharm vaccine donated by China arrived in the capital on Monday. Zimbabwe said it has bought a further 600,000 doses of the Sinopharm vaccine due for delivery in early March and was aiming to procure vaccines from Russia and through the COVAX facility being coordinated by the World Health Organization and the Global Vaccine Alliance on behalf of poorer countries. A new study has also confirmed that the new coronavirus strain first detected in South Africa in December is also now prevalent in neighboring Zimbabwe, showing up in 61% of all COVID-19 cases, according to the government. Tanzanians government insists that there are no cases of COVID-19 in the country, but residents and doctors say otherwise. Opposition politicians say the government's stance is endangering lives. Charles Kombe has this story from Tanzania's capital, Dodoma. Nasa Kiwanga visits the grave of his daughter, Tuli, who died earlier this month. Tuli died in a hospital in Dodoma, Tanzania's capital, one week after falling sick. Doctors told her family she died of pneumonia, but Kiwanga believes his daughter died of COVID-19. What sent my daughter to the hospital was that she started having breathing difficulties when at home. After that, she was sent to the hospital on Saturday morning. She lived for only two days with oxygen support. When the oxygen finished at the hospital, the life of my daughter ended there. According to a doctor who asked not to be identified, Kiwanga is correct. His daughter died of COVID-19. Since the start of COVID-19 pandemic a year ago, Tanzania's government has refused to admit the presence of the coronavirus in the country. Instead, the Tanzania's president has portrayed the pandemic as an economic opportunity. This is our time as Tanzanians as there is no COVID-19. We should use this opportunity to grow many crops so that for countries that will experience famine, we will set the prices of our products and sell to them. The government has not released any figures on coronavirus cases or death, making it impossible to gauge the true extent of the virus in Tanzania. But a few weeks ago, the U.S. Embassy in Tanzania warned that COVID-19 cases have risen considerably in the country since January. Meanwhile, Tanzanian opposition politicians such as James Mbatia are criticizing the government's position on COVID-19. I am one of the victims in my clan and our family. We had many deaths because of this problem. 
All of the symptoms are indicative of coronavirus. Others, we requested testing, and they came out positive for coronavirus. So who are we deceiving? Why are we deceiving ourselves? Tanzania's health ministry has touted the use of traditional medicine in the fight against COVID-19 and other diseases. The ministry also backs the president's recent dismissal of COVID-19 vaccines. For now, the government has no plans to receive the COVID vaccine being distributed in other countries. It should be known that the government, through the Ministry of Health, has its procedures to follow when you receive any health product. And this is done when the government is satisfied with the product. Manuel, Nasa Kiwanga and his family are collecting his daughter's belongings as they prepare to leave Dodoma for his home in the southern highlands of Tanzania. Kiwanga says he worries about those who might suffer the same fate as his daughter, victims of COVID-19 that no one is allowed to admit. Charles Kombe, for VOA News, Dodoma, Tanzania. The World Health Organization has asked six neighboring countries to Guinea to be alert for possible Ebola infections, as Guinea on Tuesday reported new cases. Gene sequencing of Ebola samples from both Congo and Guinea is being carried out to learn more about the origins of the outbreaks and identify the strains according to the WHO. In part two of Africa 54, Lino Mudus, a report with Dr. Ngoen Senga, program manager for emergency response at the WHO Regional Office for Africa, he discusses some of the concerns in dealing with Ebola outbreaks during COVID-19. So what is the greatest concern at this point with the resurgence of Ebola outbreaks in the DRC and Guinea? First of all, we are expecting that Ebola can pop up. I mean, the ecology of our countries, the virus is in the environment, is, is, is there, in the nature. So uh, is the contact between human beings and uh, the animal, especially the wild animal, that at the end we have Ebola coming up in our community. So Ebola, we are expecting to have Ebola outbreak popping up here and there. But what we don't want is to have one case, two cases, or three cases, or five cases, going into 100 cases. Instead of having one outbreak that lasts maybe two weeks, two, four weeks, a couple of weeks, but having an outbreak that lasts months, if not years, that's, that's what we don't want uh, in, in Africa. And that's the way we are trying to make our countries to reach that level of have security as soon as they get uh, they they detect cases to deal with those cases and to bring the outbreak under control. Uh, as paradoxical as it can be, I'm kind of satisfied that we can detect and we can detect when we are still having few cases. Several years ago, it was after several months when we have uh, Ebola or an outbreak that has completely gone already under control that people will wake up and say, oh, we have actually Ebola. But now countries can detect it when they still have one case, two cases, or few cases. That's, again, a sign of progr progress in terms of dealing with uh, 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 outbreaks in our region. Is there more reasons for concern when Ebola is seen outside of the DRC because of the experience that the DRC has handling this, this disease. As you can imagine, people could think, yeah, if it happened in DRC, they have capacity, they have, as I was mentioning, uh, institutional memory. That's true. But let me also bring here a, a kind of caveat learner. Every outbreak is a different outbreak. That's why countries need to get really prepared before an outbreak occurs. You remember, we were actually kind of saying the same thing when Ebola happened in Eastern DRC, because they were just coming from the ninth outbreak of Ebola in DRC. And when it came to the tenth, we were saying, oh, it's in DRC, they are going to do well. And to our surprise, it was a big challenge. And you remember that we had more than that. 3,000 cases of Ebola in Eastern DRC. Why? Because each outbreak is a different. Why is it different? It depends with so many factors. It depends with the context. It depends with the community. That's why I'm insisting from the beginning we need to bring in the community. So it depends with the community. It depends with the local capacity, not national capacity. National capacity is, is important, but local capacity. It depends also with the vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities of the population that is affected, vulnerability of the health system 
that is affected, which can be can vary not only between countries, but even within country. So these are the parameters that we need to take into account when we have an outbreak somewhere. And finally, with the COVID-19 pandemic in full swing, what will it take to fight Ebola successfully while keeping the momentum in the fight against COVID-19? And what are the challenges and opportunities of addressing Ebola outbreaks during COVID-19? First, when you look at uh, Ebola and uh, COVID, they might look different diseases. Yes, they are very different diseases uh, in terms of uh, mode of transmission. But in terms of uh, prevention measure, they are kind of have some common uh, measure of prevention. For instance, for Ebola, we are providing people to avoid touching any fluid body, bodily fluid that have been in contact with the patients or from a, a, a sick person. So for COVID, we are also advocating for social distancing. Yes, we are calling it social distancing, but I prefer the term physical distancing because we need to remain socially connected even though we are physically uh, d distancing ourselves. So those are the, 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 the measures. For the Ebola, we have other tools, very powerful tools, like vaccine. But you remember that even though we have vaccinated now, but in Africa, many countries have, are still yet to get, to, to get the vaccine. And true, because COVID is widespread, in the in the country is the whole country basically which, which is uh, affected we are dealing with the whole community the whole population while ebola usually is uh, in one localized uh, either district or zone or even a village so the measures are kind of the same but at the same time they are uh, the different and we we apply different approaches. Dr. Ngoin Senga, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate your time. It's my pleasure, Lebanon. Thank you very much for having me again today. That was Africa 54 health correspondent Lino Mudu speaking with Dr. Ngoin Senga, program manager for emergency response at the WHO Regional Office for Africa. The Biden administration on Tuesday said everything possible must be done to stop Ebola outbreaks in the African nations of Guinea and the Democratic Republic of Congo before they become large epidemics. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan on Tuesday spoke with the ambassadors of Guinea and Congo, as well as Guinea's neighbors Sierra Leone and Liberia, to convey U.S. willingness to help, according to White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki. South Africa has held its annual International Public Art Festival despite the COVID-19 pandemic and social distancing measures. Turnout was low, but those attending welcomed the street festival as a chance to get out of the house. Vincius Assisi reports from Cape Town. Scores of people attended the opening of the International Public Art Festival in Cape Town, even though South Africa has been the worst hit African country by the coronavirus pandemic. The annual street art festival strictly followed the government's COVID-19 rules, including no groups larger than 50 people, say organizers. The best way was to, to split people because we are painting outdoors and the artists are outdoors. We, every guest that wants to visit us, we put them in tiny little groups and we send them visit the, the neighborhood. The five years old festival usually attracts artists from overseas. But this year, because of the pandemic's travel restrictions, just two showed up to display their murals. Despite the low turnout, festivals like the IPAF should be held to boost South Africans' struggling tourism sector, says tour guide Annalisa Zigana. Um, you know, you need to sanitize, you need to um, keep our social distance. If we keep to those regulations, then I think it's still okay. So we can continue with the festivals, but just make sure that we keep to the, um, to the regulations, yeah. Festival attendees welcome the chance to take a break from pandemic lockdown measures aimed at preventing the virus from spreading. Uh, the fact that it's still happening, even if even the pandemic is, is still going on, and I feel like we are in need of this. We are in need of being out, of interacting with people, even if we have the mask. This year's International Public Art Festival displayed over 100 murals and focused on three points, creativity, sustainability, and safety. Vinicius Assis for VOA News, Cape Town, South Africa.
We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover during the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also, check out our headlines 24-7 on vaafrica.com. Still to come, a new app in Ghana helps expectant mothers and parents of young children save money and make payments using their mobile phones. We'll be right back. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America headquarters here in Washington. I am Shaka Sali. Straight Talk Africa, we call it like it is. We discuss issues that reflect the interests of our audience without fear or favor. We are guided by facts. And I look at myself as a servant of nothing but the truth. Welcome back to Africa 54. It's no time for business as usual. That's the message from the new head of the World Trade Organization, Gozi Okonjo Iweala. She says in these challenging times, deep and wide ranging reforms are needed within the world trade body. More with VOS Variama Diallo. I'm very proud to be the first African. I'm proud to be the first woman. Newly appointed World Trade Organization Director General Ngozi Okonjo Iweala says while she's humbled and proud of her history making role, it's important to have the competence to deliver results. I'm focusing on delivery, I'm focusing on getting results, and I want to make sure that people remember my continent producing the first leader of the WTO that made a difference. And this is not the first time the 66-year-old has made history. She was the first woman to serve as finance minister for several years and also the first female foreign minister in Nigeria. She also spent 25 years at the World Bank before returning to her country in 2003. On Twitter, an outpouring of support from bank officials celebrated her appointment. Okonjo Iwayala says trade is about people and lifting those who have been marginalized, such as women and owners of small and medium-sized businesses, into the mainstream. Fellow Nigerian Koyo Toyo, a former member of parliament and former ambassador to Ethiopia and the African Union, has worked with Okonjo Iwayala and says she is a trailblazer. Ngozi is someone who um, is a great innovator. Ngozi, it's more about what can I do differently and what change can I bring to very difficult situations. Toyo says she will bring a fresh perspective to issues such as international trade talks in the face of persistent U.S.-China conflict. I think the unique position Ngozi finds herself in is trying to ask the question, what about the rest of the world? And that gives her the space. She will have to quickly address the devastating impact of the coronavirus pandemic where she says the WTO can do a lot. So a very top priority for me would be to make sure that we come to some solutions as to how the WTO can help make vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics uh, accessible in an equitable and affordable fashion to all countries, particularly to poor countries, because right now we are lacking equitable access. The appointment, which takes effect March 1st, came after U.S. President Joe Biden endorsed her candidacy, which had been blocked by former President Donald Trump. Mariama Diallo, VOA News. President Joe Biden's reversal of restrictive immigration policies implemented by the Trump administration includes welcoming more refugees to America, raising hopes for some of the world's most desperate people. But experts say it will take time to restore the U.S. refugee resettlement program. VOS Elaine Barrows has our report. In a ticketing office in Nairobi, Kenya, Abdirazak Noor Ibrahim keeps tabs on America. Originally from Somalia, Ibrahim fled war-torn Mogadishu in 2004 and became a refugee. He and his family were approved to travel to the U.S. for resettlement in early 2017, just as Donald Trump became president and signed proclamations restricting travel from several majority Muslim countries, including Somalia. I passed all the interviews, health and everything. Then the former president introduced a travel ban. 
I have been here in the last four years, and before that, I have been here for more than 10 years, hoping that I will be resettled. Abraham applauds President Joe Biden for lifting travel restrictions and expanding U.S. refugee admissions. I am so hopeful things may change for us. Starting in October, the U.S. is set to welcome up to 125,000 refugees a year, up from a 15,000 limit at the end of the Trump administration. It's going to take time to rebuild what has been so badly damaged. Some see challenges ahead, especially during the pandemic. There will be a, a number of challenges, including on the on the funding level, on the staffing level, on just getting these processes up and going again. But arguably, the biggest or one of the biggest challenges at the moment to getting that program back to the robust levels that the U.S. administration has said it would like to see is the COVID pandemic. Even so, U.S.-based resettlement organizations hope to be busy once again. Really looking forward to staffing back up. So what we're planning on is with some of our existing partners opening additional offices. The backers of Trump's policies have misgivings, saying more rigorous security vetting helps ensure resettled refugees pose no danger so, to the United States. Um, there was a, a, a review of the vetting program at the beginning of the Trump administration, and, and that needs to be done every few years. Um, so it that should not be thrown out just because Trump's name was attached to it. Refugee advocates say security concerns are overblown. There is this claim, uh, which isn't actually true, that refugees are potentially criminals or terrorists. Um, you know, the truth is that a refugee is far less likely to commit any sort of crime than a native-born American. In Nairobi, Abraham hopes living in limbo will soon be over. I would love to go and settle in another country to leave the life of uncertainty that I have lived with here for so many years and live a better life. Eleni Barrows, VOA News, Washington. In our tech report, Ghana, like many African countries, is grappling with high maternal and perinatal mortality rates. And a new app, Trimester Save, is looking to help expectant mothers and parents of young children save money and make mobile payments using their phones. For more insight, Africa 54's technology correspondent, Paul Diho, spoke to Dr. Elvis Kumar-Forson, CEO and founder of Trimester Save in Accra, Ghana. Welcome to Africa 54. Thank you very much, Paul. Great pleasure to be talking to you. You are saving a lot of uh, lives uh, in Ghana. Uh, you've come up uh, with uh, this uh, incredible uh, technology or application that uh, you use to save lives. Can you maybe speak about that? So Trimester Save was, um, it's a solution that is premised on using financial tools um, to enable mothers achieve what we call financial birth preparedness. In short, Trimester Save is trying to improve on the financial situation of um, mothers and women in their reproductive age so that they can access better maternal health care. And we do bring technology into it where we have the technical term embedded finance where they are going through for example a pregnancy and as the pro pregnancy progresses they are also achieving savings targets so that by the time their baby arrives they also have enough funds to cater to the needs of themselves and their babies how are people em embracing uh, this kind of uh, technology that uh, you're bringing on the market the service that we offer is to go give financial literacy um, on, a, on a schedule and also then allow them to onboard remotely so they don't have to move out there. There and there, they can open an account. So accessibility has been a key factor here. And then the next important thing I should say is what channel actually works, and that's USSD. I'll just describe it. It's when you use a short code, and then you have automated responses 
um, to the short code. So here, for example, we have one as star 789, star 963 hash, and then there's a, a panel that opens and you enter information and eventually you, you, you get onboarded onto the program. You've had an opportunity, uh, both as a doctor and as a person in the tech space, uh, to interact with a lot of uh, women. What are some of the healthy concerns that uh, uh, they want uh, maybe you to address as a medical doctor or using your technology? They want better lives for themselves and they want better lives for their children. Um, then they want this, if it's been so solved by technology, for the technology to be simple. So um, you have mothers who want to be able to talk to a doctor on the mobile phone, um, do a booking and talk to a doctor, seek a second opinion if they, if they want to, and be able to have the confidentiality of discussing um, issues that they would maybe find difficult to discuss um, in some of the clinics. So I would say their major concerns have been accessibility to alternative channels of healthcare and then ease of use of technology, both to access healthcare and to access uh, the financial services. How much okay. of an impact has COVID had on you as a practicing uh, uh, doctor and on this uh, kind of business that we have trying to help women? Yes, COVID has been, um, has had a lot of impact on, on what we do. First of all, we had to rethink the strategy of um, onboarding at the antenatal care centers. So COVID pushed us to go digital as well. Um, the uncertainty around COVID made our deposit increase by 161% when all other savings products with the financial institution partners went down. The mothers who had a baby and knew that the baby would, would, would come um, out no matter what, tended to push money into their, their trimester save, savings account. So then they have the idea of insurance savings. And now we implement a, a service that we built for using AI to assess um, physical distancing and indeed all the other protocols as we onboard so we can do this safely and save lives. Very good. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Elvis. Thank you very much, Paul, for your time. That was Africa 54 tech correspondent Paul Ndiho speaking to Dr. Elvis Kuma Forson, CEO and founder of Trimester Save in Accra, Ghana. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at VOAAfrica.com.